It started with the feeling that someone was watching her. Amanda first noticed it when she left her office building one rainy October evening. She dismissed the feeling as paranoia. The streetlights cast eerie shadows, and maybe it was just the gloom settling into her bones. But as she walked toward her car, the uncomfortable sensation remained. She glanced around but only saw empty sidewalks glistening with rain. Still, she quickened her pace. The feeling of being watched began to happen regularly. At first, it was only on her way home from work. Then, she began to feel it in her apartment, too. A flicker of movement out of the corner of her eye. The prickling sensation that crept along the back of her neck. Sometimes, she even thought she heard footsteps behind her as she walked from her car to her door. But when she turned around, there was nothing there. Amanda convinced herself it was just stress from her recent breakup, but the feeling only grew worse. Then, things escalated. One evening, after a long day, she arrived home and fumbled with her keys. As she turned the key, she felt an overwhelming urge to look behind her. She did, and she froze. A figure stood in the shadows across the street, watching her intently. It was a man, tall and obscured by a hood. He didn't move, didn't make a sound. He just stood there, hands at his sides, staring directly at her. Amanda's breath caught in her throat as her eyes met his. She wanted to scream, but fear paralyzed her. She quickly unlocked her door, darted inside, and locked it behind her, heart racing. After a few minutes of calming her nerves, she dared to peek through the peephole. The man was gone. Amanda tried to tell herself it was just a coincidence, but the visits became routine. Every night, as she returned home, he was there. Sometimes she'd catch him down the street. Sometimes he'd be closer. She considered calling the police, but what could she say? That someone was standing in a public place, just looking at her. It sounded ridiculous. The real terror set in one night when she returned from a late shift. She approached her apartment building and saw the figure, once again standing in his usual spot across the street. Only this time, he was closer. Much closer. He stood on the sidewalk directly opposite her door, hands still at his sides, staring. Amanda's hand shook as she lifted her phone and snapped a picture. Her camera's flash lit up the street, and for a split second she saw his face illuminated by the glow. It was blank, almost devoid of emotion, but there was something cold in his eyes. He tilted his head slightly as though amused by her fear. Heart pounding, Amanda rushed inside, barely able to breathe. She locked the door, bolted it, and called the police. When they arrived, the man was gone. She showed them the photo she'd taken, but it was blurry. The officers were polite but skeptical, suggesting she might be overreacting due to stress or a bad breakup. Frustrated and defeated, she thanked them and tried to convince herself they were right. But deep down, she knew he'd be back. In the days that followed, she started noticing strange things around her apartment. Small things were out of place. A cup moved an inch to the left, a door left slightly ajar that she knew she had closed, and the feeling of being watched grew stronger. It was no longer just on her way home. She felt it in her living room, her kitchen, even her bedroom. One evening, as she lay in bed with the lights off, she heard a faint scratching sound coming from her bedroom window. She lived on the third floor, and logically, it was impossible for anyone to be outside her window. But the scratching continued. Her stomach churned as she gripped her phone tightly, too terrified to move. Slowly, she forced herself to turn toward the window. In the dim moonlight, she saw a face pressed against the glass, staring directly at her. It was him, the man from the street. Amanda's scream caught in her throat. She watched in horror as he grinned, his breath fogging the glass. He lifted a finger and began tracing shapes on her window, slowly and deliberately. Amanda's mind went blank with fear. She scrambled out of bed, grabbed her phone, and hid in her bathroom, calling the police through gasping breaths. When they arrived, he was gone. The officers found no evidence of anyone outside her window, and they once again suggested she might be experiencing stress-induced hallucinations. But Amanda knew what she'd seen. She knew he was real, and that he was coming closer. Over the next few weeks, Amanda's life became a nightmare. She started sleeping with the lights on and checked her locks obsessively. Yet, the feeling of being watched never left her. She quit her job and moved in with a friend, hoping to escape the terror. Her friend was understanding, though skeptical of her story. For a while, things calmed down. Amanda slowly began to feel safe again, thinking she might have finally left the nightmare behind. 
until one night when she woke up to find her phone buzzing on the bedside table. Groggy and confused, she picked it up to see an unknown number. The message read, I see you. Her heart sank as she read the text and she instinctively looked toward the window. Her breath stopped. Outside, standing on the opposite street under the streetlight, was the man. He looked directly at her window, lifting his phone in the air. Amanda's blood ran cold as she realized he had her number now. He'd followed her, tracked her, even after she'd moved. She tried blocking the number, but every night, a new one would text her, each message growing more sinister and intimate. Finally, she couldn't take it anymore. She decided to confront him, demanding that he leave her alone. She texted back, What do you want from me? There was no reply, but that night he didn't come, nor the next. Amanda's life slowly returned to normal, and the fear she'd once felt began to fade. A month passed without a single message or sighting. She dared to believe he'd finally given up. Until one morning, as she was making her coffee, she noticed something on her kitchen counter. A note, written in familiar, chilling handwriting. I'll always be watching. Her heart stopped as she realized the implications. He'd been inside, he knew her new life, her safe place, and he wanted her to know that he could come back anytime he wanted. Amanda moved far away after that, hoping to escape him once and for all. But every so often she feels that familiar prickling sensation like someone's watching her, and though she tries to ignore it, deep down she knows he's still out there, waiting, watching, and never truly gone. Story number two. It was a chilly October evening, and the trees outside Alex's apartment rustled ominously in the wind. Alex had just moved to the small town of Millstone, hoping to escape the hustle and bustle of city life. The quaintness of the town charmed him, but he had always been a little on edge since moving in. The isolation of the place felt comforting, yet disconcerting. As he settled in, he started noticing odd things. At first, it was just a sense of being watched, a shiver down his spine whenever he glanced out the window. He brushed it off as paranoia, an effect of the change in scenery and the stress of moving. However, his unease escalated when he found footprints in the snow leading away from his front door one morning. They were large and unmistakable, yet he lived alone and had heard no noise the previous night. Probably just a neighbor, he muttered to himself, deciding to chalk it up to someone else in the building. But as days turned into weeks, the footprints became a persistent mystery. Each morning, there they were, fresh impressions in the snow, leading away from his door and disappearing into the shadows of the trees lining the path to his building. The sensation of being watched grew stronger. He felt it when he was cooking dinner or lounging on the couch, the hairs on the back of his neck prickling as he glanced at the darkened windows outside. He installed blinds, thinking they would provide some peace of mind, but they did little to ease his anxiety. One night, as he was about to turn in, Alex received a text from an unknown number. The message read, I see you. His heart raced. He glanced around his small apartment, the walls suddenly feeling as if they were closing in on him. He quickly replied, Who is this? But received no response. That night, sleep eluded him. Every creak of the building seemed amplified, and every rustle of the wind sounded like a whisper. He kept his phone close, on high alert, Hours passed, and he eventually succumbed to exhaustion, the screen illuminating the dark room as he drifted off. The following day, he decided to report the strange messages and footprints to the police. Officer Jenkins, a grizzled man with a skeptical look, took down the details but seemed dismissive. Just keep your doors locked and stay aware. It's probably just a prank, he said before leaving. Alex felt a wave of frustration wash over him. How could they not take this seriously? That night, feeling slightly reassured by the police visit, he tried to push the unsettling thoughts from his mind. As he prepared for bed, he heard a faint scratching sound. It was coming from his front door. His heart raced, and he froze, straining to hear over the pounding of his pulse. The scratching persisted, a gentle, rhythmic sound that sent chills down his spine. He tiptoed to the door, peering through the peephole. Nothing. The hallway outside was dimly lit and empty. He took a deep breath, convinced it was just his imagination playing tricks on him. But as he turned away, he heard it again, this time louder and more insistent. Terrified, Alex backed away from the door and grabbed his phone, ready to call for help. Suddenly, the scratching stopped, replaced by a soft voice calling out, Let me in, Alex. I just want to talk. 
Panic surged through him. He knew that voice. It was a girl from his building, Emily, who he had spoken to only briefly a few times. She had always seemed odd, her eyes too wide and her laughter just a bit too loud. Go away, he shouted, his voice trembling. I'm calling the police. Please, Alex, I'm just trying to help you, she pleaded, her voice now laced with desperation. In a moment of pure instinct, he darted for the phone, dialing 911 with shaking fingers. But as he did, he heard the sound of footsteps retreating down the hall. He rushed to the door and opened it a crack, peering out into the dark corridor. No one was there. After reporting the incident, the police assured him they would send someone to patrol the area. He felt a bit safer, knowing they would be on the lookout. But as the days wore on, things escalated. He received more texts, each one more menacing than the last. I know what you did. I see you when you're sleeping. Each message made him feel increasingly trapped. He didn't dare venture out at night anymore. Even the thought of stepping outside sent waves of dread through him. One evening, after a particularly long day at work, he returned home to find his door slightly ajar. A lump formed in his throat as he pushed it open, half expecting to find someone inside. But the apartment was empty, untouched. Yet, a sense of dread filled the air. He grabbed his phone and locked the door behind him, the click of the lock echoing ominously. That night, he lay in bed, the darkness suffocating. Suddenly, he heard it again, the soft scratching at the door, followed by that same haunting voice, Alex, let me in. He knew it was Emily. She had lost her mind, and it terrified him. Go away, he screamed, desperation clawing at his throat. The scratching intensified, followed by a frantic pounding. I know you're in there. You can't hide from me. His instincts kicked in. He rushed to the kitchen and grabbed a knife, his heart racing. As he held it tightly, the door rattled violently. Let me in. I just want to see you. In that moment, he heard a crash. A window in the back of the apartment shattered. Alex turned, his heart pounding. He rushed toward the sound, adrenaline fueling his every movement. To his horror, he found Emily climbing through the broken window, her face twisted into a frenzied expression. I told you I would find you, she shrieked, lunging towards him. Alex swung the knife in a panic, missing her by inches as he stumbled backward. In that split second, he realized he had to get out of there. He bolted for the front door, the sound of Emily's frantic laughter echoing behind him. He threw open the door and ran, his feet pounding against the pavement as he dashed into the night. He didn't stop until he reached the nearest police station, breathless and terrified. He explained everything, and the officers took immediate action. Days passed as the police searched for Emily. The apartment was deemed a crime scene, and Alex was left feeling lost and vulnerable. But the dread never left him. He could still feel her eyes on him, even in the safety of the station. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, they apprehended her. She had been stalking him for weeks, her obsession spiraling out of control. When Alex returned to the apartment to retrieve his things, the sense of fear still lingered. The walls felt like they were closing in, shadows dancing in the corners of his vision. He decided to leave Millstone for good. As he drove away, he glanced back at the town, feeling a sense of relief mixed with lingering dread. He didn't know if Emily would ever be truly gone, but one thing was certain. He would never forget the chilling realization that someone could become so consumed by obsession that they would stop at nothing to invade another's life. Story number three. The small town of Maplewood had always been quiet, nestled among thick woods and rolling hills. Its residents prided themselves on their close-knit community where everyone knew each other by name. But beneath this idyllic facade lay secrets that would soon shatter their peace. Sarah Thompson was a typical teenager, enjoying her last year of high school and dreaming of the future. She was excited to graduate and attend college in the fall, leaving her small town behind. But something changed that spring. It started with a series of odd occurrences, things that made her heart race and her skin crawl. It began innocently enough. She first noticed it while walking home from school one afternoon. A figure stood at the edge of the woods, partially hidden among the trees. At first, she thought it was just her imagination playing tricks on her. The figure seemed to dissolve into the shadows whenever she looked directly at it, only to reappear when she glanced away. Shaking her head, she brushed it off and continued on her way. The next day, as she approached her home, she spotted the figure again, standing closer this time, just beyond her yard. 
It was a man, tall and thin, with a hood obscuring his face. Fear gripped her, and she rushed inside, locking the door behind her. She didn't tell anyone. Who would believe her? Days turned into weeks, and the figure became a regular sight. No matter where she went, school, the grocery store, even the park, he seemed to be lurking nearby. Whenever she caught a glimpse of him, he would either stare at her or turn and walk away. The hairs on the back of her neck stood on end, and her heart raced every time she thought about him. She confided in her best friend, Lily. I think someone is watching me, Sarah said, her voice trembling. Lily, always the rational one, tried to calm her fears. Maybe you're just being paranoid. It's probably just some guy who doesn't even know you. He's probably harmless. But Sarah couldn't shake the feeling of dread. She began to feel trapped in her own home, refusing to go out alone. Her parents noticed her anxiety, but, but attributed it to typical teenage stress. They encouraged her to talk to someone or seek help, but Sarah didn't want to seem weak. Instead, she resorted to keeping a journal, documenting every sighting and feeling, hoping that writing it down would help. One night, after an especially long day at school, Sarah lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, unable to sleep. Her mind raced with thoughts of the stalker. Suddenly, she heard a noise outside her window, a faint rustling sound. Her heart thudded in her chest as she peered out into the darkness. The figure was there, standing at the edge of her property, uh, silhouetted against the moonlight. Trembling, she grabbed her phone and snapped a picture. The flash startled him, and he turned and fled into the woods. Breathing heavily, Sarah raced downstairs to show her parents the photo, convinced that this would finally make them believe her. But when she showed them, they frowned in concern. It could just be a neighbor, her father suggested. You should focus on your studies and stop worrying about this. Defeated, uh, Sarah returned to her room, but sleep eluded her. The next day, she decided to take matters into her own hands. She started carrying pepper spray and a small knife in her bag. She felt empowered, but the fear never fully subsided. A week later, while walking home from school with Lily, Sarah noticed the man again. This time, he was following them at a distance, blending into the shadows. She felt her heart race as she quickened her pace, her anxiety surging. Are you okay? Lily asked, glancing back. You look pale. That man, he's following us, Sarah whispered, glancing over her shoulder. But when they looked back, he had vanished. Lily shrugged it off as another case of Sarah's overactive imagination. But later that evening, Sarah received a text from an unknown number. I see you. Panic gripped her. She texted back, demanding to know who it was, but received no response. Instead, she felt the weight of the world crashing down. The next few nights passed in a haze of fear and paranoia. She stayed up late, checking the locks on every window and door, jumping at every sound. On a Saturday night, her parents went out for dinner, leaving Sarah home alone. She sat in her room, trying to distract herself with a movie, but her mind was elsewhere. Suddenly, she heard a loud bang from the back door. Her heart stopped, and she grabbed her phone, ready to call 911 if necessary. As she crept down the hallway, the sound came again, this time a scratching noise like nails on wood. With trembling hands, she reached the back door and peered through the glass. The figure stood just outside, his face still hidden in the shadows. Fear coursed through her, and she quickly locked the door, her heart racing. She dialed 911, whispering into the phone, explaining the situation. The operator assured her that help was on the way, but as she hung up, the scratching noise turned to pounding. The figure was trying to get in. In a panic, Sarah ran upstairs, barricading herself in her room. Minutes felt like hours as she waited for sirens, terrified that he would break through. Just as she was about to lose hope, she heard the unmistakable sound of police lights flashing outside. Relief washed over her, but it was short-lived. She watched through her window as the police confronted the figure. Uh, he seemed unbothered by the officers, casually raising his hands in surrender. Then, in a shocking twist, he turned and fled into the woods, disappearing from view. The police chased after him, but he was gone. They searched the area, but found nothing. When they returned to Sarah, they reassured her that they would do everything they could to catch him, but he was already part of the shadows, slipping through their grasp. That night, as Sarah tried to sleep, she couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. She locked her bedroom door and turned off the lights, but sleep eluded her. Every creak of the house made her jump. 
Just as she was starting to drift off, a soft knock echoed from her window. Fear gripped her as she turned to look. The figure stood there, his face still shrouded in darkness. Sarah froze, her mind racing. How had he found her? In that moment, she remembered the pepper spray in her bag. Heart pounding, she quietly reached for it. With trembling hands, she opened her window and aimed. Get away from me, she shouted, her voice a mix of terror and defiance. The figure didn't move. Instead, he tilted his head slightly, almost curiously. Then, with a swift motion, he turned and vanished into the night. That was the last time she saw him, but the memory haunted her. The police never caught him, and the fear of being stalked lingered in her mind long after the incident. Sarah moved away for college, but even then, she felt a shadow following her, a reminder that some horrors never truly fade. Years later, she returned to Maplewood, hoping to confront her fears. As she walked through the familiar streets, a chill ran down her spine. She glanced over her shoulder and saw a figure standing at the edge of the woods, watching her with an intensity that made her blood run cold. And even though she was no longer the scared teenager, the terror surged back, reminding her that some nightmares are never really over. Story number four. It was supposed to be a peaceful getaway. Julia and her boyfriend Sam had been looking forward to a weekend in the mountains, away from the chaos of their daily lives. They'd rented a small cabin deep in the woods, surrounded by towering trees and complete silence. The perfect escape, Julia thought. The first night was calm, the kind of silence where the only sounds were the crackling fire and their soft murmurs. But Julia had trouble sleeping, plagued by an odd sensation. Every so often she'd sit up, peering through the cabin's windows into the thick blackness of the woods, almost certain she'd seen movement. Sam laughed it off when she mentioned it, blaming it on her overactive imagination. But Julia couldn't shake the feeling that something or someone was out there, watching. The next morning, they decided to hike. The sun shone through the canopy, and for a while, Julia relaxed, breathing in the fresh, cool air and brushing off her fears. But as they ventured deeper into the woods, she began to feel uneasy. Several times, she thought she heard footsteps behind them, crunching leaves and snapping twigs. Whenever she turned around, though, the forest was empty. By the time they returned to the cabin, she was exhausted. That night, they went to bed early, and Sam quickly fell asleep. Julia, on the other hand, lay awake, eyes wide open, to rush, straining to hear any noise outside. Around midnight, she heard it, a faint tapping sound on the window. Her heart leapt, and she lay perfectly still, listening. She wanted to believe it was just a branch brushing against the glass, but the sound was too rhythmic, too deliberate. It was as though someone was tapping, trying to get her attention. She nudged Sam awake, whispering about the sound. He groaned, sat up, and groggily glanced out the window. But whatever had been there was gone. With a huff, Sam went back to bed, dismissing her fears as nothing more than nerves. But Julia was certain someone had been there. The next day, they went into town to pick up some supplies. At the store, Julia overheard two locals discussing a strange man who'd been spotted wandering the area at night, drifting from cabin to cabin. Apparently, he wore dark clothing and a hood that concealed his face. People who saw him described a sense of deep unease, as though his eyes bored straight through them. The locals called him The Stranger. Julia's skin prickled. She tried to tell Sam what she'd heard, but he laughed it off, saying the locals probably just like to scare tourists with ghost stories. Julia forced a laugh, but the unease lingered. She'd felt him. She knew he was real. That night, the tapping returned, louder and more insistent. Julia sat up, her heart hammering as she stared at the window, dreading what she might see. She gripped Sam's arm and whispered his name, but he was sound asleep. Summoning her courage, she grabbed the flashlight from the bedside table, turned it on, and shined it toward the window. There, just outside, stood a figure in a dark hood, his face shadowed, his body still. His head was tilted slightly, and he seemed to be looking right at her, watching. Julia's breath caught in her throat. She froze, unable to look away. His face was hidden, but something about his posture, the way he stood so unnaturally still, filled her with terror. Her hand shook as she nudged Sam again, harder this time, whispering frantically for him to wake up. But by the time he sat up, rubbing his eyes, the figure was gone. The next day, they considered leaving, but Sam convinced her to stay, promising he'd keep watch that night. Julia reluctantly agreed. 
She wanted to enjoy the weekend they'd planned that, but her instincts screamed that something was horribly wrong. That night, they double-checked the doors and windows, making sure everything was locked. Sam stayed up with her, flashlight in hand, both of them keeping a tense watch on the windows. Hours passed, and Julia began to feel her eyelids grow heavy. Maybe he really was just a figment of her imagination. But then, around 3 a.m., the silence broke. A soft scratching sound echoed from the front door, so faint it was almost imperceptible. Julia's heart pounded as she and Sam exchanged a glance. Sam tightened his grip on the flashlight and crept toward the door, motioning for her to stay back. He pressed his ear against the door and the scratching stopped. Julia's breath caught as she saw a note slip under the door, a scrap of paper that slid quietly across the floor. Sam looked at her, his face pale, and picked up the note. Scrawled in shaky, almost childlike handwriting were the words, I can see you. Julia felt sick. She wanted to leave immediately, but Sam tried to rationalize, suggesting it was just a prank. Julia wasn't so sure, but with no other choice, she reluctantly agreed to wait, wait until morning. Julia barely slept that night, listening to every creak, every groan of the cabin, certain the stranger was just outside, watching, waiting. As dawn broke, she finally drifted off, too exhausted to keep her eyes open. When she woke, the first rays of light were streaming through the window, and she felt a wave of relief. It was over. They could leave. She turned to shake Sam awake, but as her hand touched his shoulder, she froze. On the ceiling, scrawled in the same shaky handwriting, was a message. I was here. Was here. Julia's blood ran cold. She couldn't understand how it was possible. They'd locked everything, secured every window and door. She scrambled out of bed, shaking Sam awake, and when he saw the message, he didn't question her this time. They left the cabin within minutes, driving back to town without a word. Julia's skin crawled, and every shadow along the road seemed to shift as though he was still there, following them. Julia never returned to those woods again. But sometimes, late at night, when she's home alone, she hears a faint tapping on her window. And though she's too afraid to look, she knows the stranger is out there, watching and waiting for the next time he'll show her just how close he can come. Story number five. Samantha had always loved the quaint charm of Willow Creek. Nestled in the heart of the countryside, it was a perfect escape from her hectic life in the city. The townspeople were friendly, the air was fresh, and the sunsets were breathtaking. She felt drawn to an old Victorian house on the edge of town with its weathered facade and overgrown garden. It was everything she had dreamed of and more. However, as soon as she moved in, things began to feel a bit off. It started with the whispers. At night, when the wind howled outside, she could swear she heard soft murmurs echoing through the halls. She brushed it off as the house settling. Old homes had a tendency to creak and groan. But as the days passed, the whispers grew louder, more distinct, and more unsettling. One evening, after a long day of unpacking, Samantha decided to take a break. She poured herself a glass of wine and sank into the worn leather couch in the living room. Just as she began to relax, she noticed movement outside the window. A figure stood at the edge of her property, shrouded in shadows. She squinted, trying to make out who it was, but the figure vanished before she could get a good look. Feeling a chill creep up her spine, she shook her head, telling herself it was just her imagination. However, her unease returned when she noticed that the figure appeared again the next night. It lingered in the same spot, watching her with an intensity that sent shivers down her back. She considered calling the police, but part of her didn't want to seem paranoid. Days turned into weeks, and the figure continued to haunt her, always just out of sight but ever-present. Samantha began to feel as though she was being watched, even inside her own home. At night, she kept the curtains drawn, the lights on, and the doors locked, yet that gnawing sense of dread never left her. One afternoon, while grocery shopping in town, she bumped into Mrs. Thompson, a sweet older woman who lived a few houses down. They chatted for a while, and Samantha couldn't help but mention the figure that had been watching her. Oh dear, Mrs. Thompson said, her face pale. That's just what he does. He's harmless, really, but it's best to keep your distance. He's been around for years. A bit eccentric, you know. Eccentric? Samantha echoed, her heart racing. Who is he? Just a local man named Leonard. He lost his family in a tragic accident many years ago, and ever since then, he's been a bit unwell. He likes to watch people from a distance, especially new residents. 
but he won't hurt you, dear. Just ignore him and he'll move on. Samantha tried to dismiss the old woman's words, but the idea of Leonard lingered in her mind. She felt a mixture of sympathy and fear. How could someone become so detached from reality? Yet, the thought of the man standing outside her window watching her made her skin crawl. As the nights grew longer, the whispers in the house became more frequent. It was as if the walls were trying to communicate with her, sharing secrets that were better left unspoken. The air turned thick with tension, and Samantha's sense of security eroded with every passing day. One evening, after a particularly unsettling day, Samantha decided to take a stroll around the neighborhood. She hoped that some fresh air would help clear her mind. As she walked, she caught sight of Leonard standing by the old oak tree at the end of the street. He wore a tattered coat and a wide-brimmed hat that obscured his face. She felt a jolt of panic, but curiosity compelled her to approach him. Hello, she called, trying to sound friendly. Leonard turned slowly, and she finally caught a glimpse of his eyes. They were hollow, sunken, and devoid of emotion. Hello, Samantha, he replied, his voice gravelly and distant. How do you know my name? she asked, a lump forming in her throat. I know everyone in Willow Creek, he said, stepping closer. I've been watching you. Fear surged through her, but she stood her ground. Why do you watch me? I like to see how people live. You're different from the others, he said, his gaze never wavering. You have something special about you. Samantha felt a wave of nausea wash over her. I think you should leave me alone, she said firmly, backing away. Leonard's expression darkened. You can't run from me, Samantha. I'll always be here, watching. Terrified, she turned and fled, sprinting back to her house. She locked the door behind her and leaned against it, her heart racing. She felt as if she had escaped a nightmare, but the reality of her situation loomed over her like a heavy fog. Leonard was no longer just a shadow outside her window. He was a tangible threat. That night, she barely slept. The whispers grew louder, and she could almost make out words, Stay with me. You belong to me. It felt as though the house itself was alive, breathing with an energy that felt oppressive. The following day, Samantha decided enough was enough. She called the police, explaining her situation and the encounters with Leonard. The officer who arrived was, was sympathetic but skeptical. We can keep an eye on him, but unless he's done something illegal, there's not much we can do. Feeling defeated, Samantha returned to her daily routine, trying to ignore the presence that lingered outside her home. But Leonard's shadow never left her mind, and the whispers in the house only intensified. One fateful night, unable to shake her anxiety, she decided to confront Leonard again. Armed with pepper spray, she stepped outside, her heart pounding in her chest. The moon was full, casting an eerie glow over the neighborhood. Leonard, she shouted, hoping to find him before he could hide. To her surprise, he appeared almost instantly, emerging from the shadows like a specter. What do you want, Samantha? He asked, his voice echoing in the stillness. I want you to leave me alone. You're scaring me, she yelled, brandishing the pepper spray. Scaring you? I just want to help, he replied, stepping closer. You're special, and I can help you unlock your true potential. Stay back, she screamed, feeling the terror grip her. But he continued to advance, and in a moment of panic, she pressed down on the spray, releasing a cloud of chemicals directly into his face. Leonard howled in pain, stumbling backward and clutching his eyes. Why did you do that? I just wanted to show you. Samantha ran back to her house, locking the door and peering out through the window. Leonard stood outside, his face twisted with rage and pain. You'll regret this, Samantha. You'll see. That night, the, wisp the whispers turned into full-fledged screams echoing through the halls of her home. Shadows danced across the walls and the air grew thick with despair. Samantha felt as if the house were closing in on her, suffocating her with a weight she couldn't bear. The next morning, she awoke to find her front yard littered with dead flowers and twisted branches. It was as if nature itself was mourning the darkness that had settled over her life. The whispers had stopped, replaced by an eerie silence that felt more ominous than before. Samantha knew she couldn't stay in Willow Creek any longer. She packed her belongings in a frantic rush, her heart racing with every sound outside. Just as she was about to leave, she caught a glimpse of Leonard standing at the edge of her property, watching her with a sinister smile. You can't escape me, Samantha, he called, his voice dripping with malice. I'll always be watching. With that, she jumped into her car and sped away, 
leaving the nightmare behind her. As she drove into the distance, the town faded from view, but she could still feel his presence lurking in the shadows, waiting for the next opportunity to strike. Story number six. When Claire first moved to the quaint little town of Brooksville, she was enchanted by its charm. The tree-lined streets, friendly neighbors, and cozy coffee shops made it seem like the perfect place to escape the chaos of city life. But as she settled into her new home, something began to unravel the tranquility she craved. It started on a chilly October evening. Claire had just finished unpacking boxes in her new apartment when she noticed a figure standing across the street. The man was tall and lanky, wearing a dark hoodie that obscured his face. He stood completely still, gazing at her building. Claire felt a shiver run down her spine, but she quickly dismissed it as paranoia, a common side effect of moving to a new place alone. As the days went by, Claire often caught glimpses of the man. He seemed to appear out of nowhere, lingering outside her apartment, sometimes during the day, but mostly at night. His presence made her uneasy, but she told herself it was just her imagination running wild. After all, it was a small town. How dangerous could it be? One evening, while Claire was walking home from a late shift at the diner, she noticed the man again, this time standing even closer, just outside her building. Heart racing, she quickened her pace, trying to convince herself that he was just a passerby. But as she reached her door, she could feel his eyes on her, piercing through the dark. Over the next week, things escalated. Claire began to receive strange notes slipped under her door. They were brief, cryptic messages that sent chills down her spine. I see you, read one. You're mine, wrote another. The notes made her stomach turn, but she didn't want to alarm her friends or call the police just yet. She feared they would think she was overreacting. However, the notes continued to come, each more threatening than the last. One night, she found a note that simply said, I'm closer than you think. It felt like a punch to the gut. Determined not to let fear control her, she decided to take action. Claire contacted the local police and reported the situation, but they brushed it off as a prank. They suggested she should be more cautious, perhaps even consider installing a security system. Feeling frustrated, Claire began to take her own precautions. She started carrying pepper spray, avoiding walking alone at night, and made sure to lock her doors and windows before bed. But no matter what she did, the feeling of being watched persisted. Then came the night that changed everything. Claire was home alone, binge watching a new series, when she heard a soft knock at her door. Confused, she glanced at the clock. It was nearly midnight. Reluctant to answer, she peered through the peephole and gasped. The figure stood there, mere inches from her door, the hood pulled low, concealing his face. She backed away, heart pounding in her chest. This was no coincidence. She reached for her phone to call the police, but hesitated. What could she say? There's a man at my door? Instead, she decided to stay silent, hoping he would leave. Minutes passed like hours. The knocking intensified, becoming more insistent. I know you're in there, Claire, he called, his voice low and menacing. Let me in. We need to talk. Panic surged through her. How did he know her name? She moved to the back of her apartment, desperately trying to think of a plan. Just as she was about to call 911, she heard a loud crash. The man had kicked the door in. Adrenaline rushed through her veins as she raced to her bedroom and locked the door. She could hear him moving around the apartment, calling her name in a mocking tone. I just want to talk, Claire. You've been ignoring me. Each word dripped with menace. She dialed 911, whispering her situation into the phone, praying they would arrive in time. Suddenly, she heard footsteps approaching her bedroom door. I know you're in there, he said, a sinister grin evident in his voice. We can play this game all night, but I will find you. Claire pressed her back against the wall, desperately hoping the police would show up. Just then, her phone buzzed with a notification. It was a message from her friend Mia, asking if she was okay. Claire quickly typed a response, but just as she was about to hit send, the man kicked the bedroom door open. Time seemed to freeze. Claire's heart raced as she prepared to defend herself. The man stepped into the room, a shadow of malice. But before he could react, she hurled the pepper spray at him. It caught him off guard, and he stumbled back, swiping at his eyes. Get away from me! Claire screamed, rushing past him toward the window. She threw it open and screamed for help, but the street below was eerily quiet. 
In that moment of desperation, she remembered the fire escape. She climbed out onto the narrow ledge, balancing precariously as she made her way down. The man, still blinded and furious, cursed behind her. You can't escape me! He yelled. Claire's heart pounded as she descended, the metal ladder clanging beneath her. She hit the ground hard and took off running down the alley, her feet pounding against the pavement. She could hear him behind her, the sound of his footsteps growing fainter as she sprinted towards the main road. After what felt like an eternity, she burst into a busy street where people were still out and about. She spotted a group of men outside a bar and ran to them, gasping for breath. Help me! There's a man after me! The group immediately took her seriously and one of them called the police. They stayed with her until help arrived, surrounding her with their bodies as if to shield her from the looming threat. When the police arrived, Claire recounted the terrifying events. They immediately sent officers to her apartment where they found signs of forced entry and the remnants of the chaos left behind. Um, but the man was nowhere to be found. He had disappeared into the night. The police reassured her that they would do everything they could to find him, but Claire felt a nagging fear that he was still out there, watching, watching, and waiting. Despite their efforts, the weeks passed with no sign of the man. Claire moved in with Mia for safety, but the shadows of Brooksville felt suffocating. Months later, as Claire was attempting to rebuild her life, she received a letter in the mail. It was from the man, postmarked from a nearby town. I'm still watching you, Claire. You can't escape me. The fear that had haunted her for months resurfaced, a cold chill wrapping around her heart. Claire decided then that she would never be able to escape her stalker's grasp, no matter how far she ran or how many precautions she took. As she stared at the letter, she understood that sometimes the monsters don't hide in the dark. They live among us, lurking in the shadows of our everyday lives, waiting for the moment to strike. Story number seven. Megan had always been fascinated by old houses. So when she found a charming Victorian home for sale in a small town, she was immediately drawn to it. The price was surprisingly low, and though she felt a shiver of unease when she first stepped inside, she brushed it off as excitement. It had a grand staircase, intricate woodwork, and beautiful stained glass windows that let in colorful light. After a month of renovations, Megan moved in, eh, ready to start fresh in her new home. The first night was quiet, filled only with the creaks and groans of an old house settling. But as she wandered around, she couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The air felt thick, heavy with a presence she couldn't quite place. On the second night, she awoke to the sound of whispering. Confused, she sat up and listened closely. It sounded like it was coming from the hallway. Clutching her blanket, she peeked out of her bedroom door but saw nothing. Shaking off her nerves, she convinced herself it was just her imagination playing tricks on her. But the whispers returned each night, growing clearer and more insistent. They seemed to echo off the walls, mingling with the sounds of the house. One night, in a fit of frustration, Megan followed the whispers to the end of the hallway where a mirror hung on the wall. It was a beautiful antique piece, its frame intricately carved and slightly tarnished. As she stood before it, the whispers crescendoed, forming words she couldn't quite make out. Megan leaned closer, her breath fogging the glass, and for a fleeting moment she thought she saw a figure behind her reflection. A woman dressed in a long, flowing gown, her face obscured by shadows. Startled, Megan stepped back, her heart racing. She dismissed it as a trick of the light, but unease gnawed at her. The next day, Megan decided to investigate the history of her new home. The local library was filled with old records and newspapers, and after some digging, she uncovered a tragic story. Years ago, a woman named Eliza had lived in the house. She was known for her beauty and grace, but mysteriously vanished one winter night. Rumors swirled about her fate, with some believing she had been murdered, while others whispered she had simply run away. The mystery of her disappearance hung over the town like a dark cloud. That night, Megan returned home, feeling a strange connection to Eliza. She stood in front of the mirror again, whispering softly, Are you here, Eliza? The air felt charged, and for a brief moment, she thought she saw the woman's face again, clearer this time, a desperate longing in her eyes. The whispers intensified, and Megan felt an overwhelming urge to touch the glass. As her fingers brushed against the mirror's surface, everything changed. A wave of energy surged through her, pulling her closer. 
Suddenly, the world around her warped, and she found herself standing in a dimly lit room, the air thick with the scent of flowers and decay. The mirror had become a doorway. Panic surged as she realized she was trapped in a strange version of her own home. The walls were adorned with peeling wallpaper, and the furniture was draped in white sheets. Shadows danced around her, whispering Eliza's name. Help me, a voice echoed, chilling her to the core. I am trapped. You must find me. Megan turned to run, but the shadows closed in, their whispers turning into shrieks. You can't leave. You must stay. The panic surged, and just as quickly as it began, the room dissolved, and she was back in her own hallway, gasping for breath. The mirror was silent, its surface reflecting only her pale face. Shaken, Megan staggered back, her mind racing. What had just happened? Had it been a dream? But the sense of urgency was undeniable. Eliza needed her help. Over the next few days, Megan became obsessed with the mirror. She felt drawn to it, compelled to uncover the truth. Each night, the whispers returned, calling to her, urging her to dive deeper into the mystery. She researched everything she could about Eliza and the circumstances surrounding her disappearance. She discovered that Eliza had last been seen near the woods behind the house, a place where no one dared to go alone. One night, determined to find answers, Megan gathered a flashlight and ventured into the woods. The trees loomed ominously around her, the air thick with tension. She followed a narrow path, guided only by the dim light of her flashlight and the faint whispers that seemed to lead her deeper. Eventually, she stumbled upon a clearing. In the center stood a dilapidated old shed, half hidden by overgrown vines. The whispers grew louder, echoing in her mind, urging her to enter. Heart racing, she approached the door, which creaked open with a gentle push. Inside, the air was stale and heavy. Megan's flashlight beam swept across the room, revealing old furniture covered in dust. But it was the wall that caught her attention. There, scratched into the wood, were words. Help me. Beneath it was a faint outline of a figure, a woman in a gown. Suddenly a chill swept through the room and the temperature dropped. The whispers intensified, swirling around her like a tempest. You found me, a voice whispered, soft yet urgent. Megan felt a presence behind her, a weight in the air. She turned slowly and there was Eliza, her ghostly figure shimmering in the darkness, sadness etched on her ethereal face. I'm trapped, Eliza pleaded. They took my life, but my spirit remains. You must help me find peace. Megan's heart raced. What do I need to do? The mirror, Eliza whispered, her voice trembling. It holds the key. You must release me. Megan nodded, determination flooding through her. She ran back to the cabin, her mind racing with fear and hope. The mirror awaited her, silent and ominous. She stood before it, feeling the energy pulsing within. Eliza, she called out, I'm here. The whispers echoed in response, and she felt the air around her shift. You must break the glass, Eliza urged, her voice resonating with urgency. Taking a deep breath, Megan raised a heavy object she had found in the shed, a rusted old lantern, and with all her might, smashed it against the mirror. The glass shattered, splintering into a thousand shards and a blinding light erupted, engulfing the room. Megan shielded her eyes, and as the light faded, she felt a profound stillness settle around her. When she opened her eyes, the mirror was gone, replaced by a shimmering veil of mist. Eliza stood before her, a soft smile on her face. You freed me, she whispered, her form slowly fading. Thank you. As Eliza's spirit dissipated into the air, Megan felt a weight lift from her heart. The house was no longer heavy with sorrow. It felt light, filled with peace. She had broken the curse that bound Eliza to this world. From that day on, Megan cherished her home, free from the shadows of the past. Though the whispers had stopped, she often found herself looking out into the woods, a sense of gratitude washing over her. Eliza was finally at peace, and so was she. Story number eight. The quaint town of Cedar Hollow had always been known for its picturesque scenery and friendly locals. Sarah moved there to start fresh after a messy divorce. The small, cozy house she rented was nestled on the outskirts, surrounded by dense woods that whispered secrets in the wind. It felt like a perfect getaway, a place where she could rebuild her life away from the chaos of the city. At first, everything seemed idyllic. Enough the neighbors were warm and welcoming, and Sarah quickly made friends. She spent her days gardening and exploring the nearby trails, enjoying the solitude. But as the weeks passed, a creeping unease began to settle in. It started with little things, 
she would find her garden tools moved from where she left them, or the door would be slightly ajar when she was sure she had locked it. At first, she dismissed these occurrences as forgetfulness or her imagination running wild. After all, she was alone for the first time in years, and adjusting to solitude was challenging. One evening, after a long day, Sarah decided to unwind with a book. She settled into her favorite chair, the soft glow of the lamp casting a warm light around her. Just as she was getting absorbed in the story, she heard a soft thud outside. Startled, she glanced out the window, but the night was still, save for the rustling leaves. Over the next few days, the thuds grew more frequent, punctuating her evenings. One night, she heard the unmistakable sound of someone tapping on her window. Heart racing, she peered through the curtain but saw only darkness. She convinced herself it was the wind playing tricks on her, but the fear gnawed at her. Determined not to let fear control her, Sarah decided to call a friend. Emily, her closest companion from the city, agreed to visit for the weekend. As Sarah prepared for Emily's arrival, she felt a flicker of relief. At least she wouldn't be alone. When Emily arrived, the house felt brighter and more alive. They spent the evening catching up, laughing over glasses of wine and sharing stories. As they settled down for the night, Sarah felt a weight lift off her shoulders. But when they turned off the lights, Sarah's unease returned. Around midnight, a loud bang jolted them awake. It came from the back of the house. Did you hear that? Emily whispered, her voice laced with concern. Yeah, I did. Sarah replied, panic rising in her throat. They listened intently, the silence of the house broken only by the sound of their own breathing. Then they heard it again. Soft footsteps outside the window, the faint creak of branches brushing against the glass. Let's check it out, Emily suggested, her curiosity peaked despite the fear in her eyes. With trembling hands, Sarah grabbed a flashlight, and they cautiously made their way to the back door. As they stepped outside, the chill in the air sent shivers down their spines. They swept the flashlight across the yard, illuminating the shadows of the trees. Suddenly they spotted movement, a figure darting between the trees. Sarah's heart raced as she shined the light in the direction of the shadow, but it vanished before she could get a good look. What the hell was that? Emily gasped, gripping Sarah's arm tightly. I don't know, Sarah admitted, her voice barely a whisper. But we need to go back inside. They rushed back inside and locked the door, adrenaline coursing through their veins. The two women huddled together on the couch, the safety of the four walls feeling fragile. Maybe it was just an animal, Emily said, though the uncertainty in her voice betrayed her confidence. I hope so, Sarah replied, her mind racing with thoughts of who or what might be lurking outside. The next day, they decided to investigate. Armed with courage and the need for answers, they explored the woods behind the house. As they ventured deeper, they stumbled upon a clearing where they found an old dilapidated cabin. Its windows were shattered and the door hung crookedly on its hinges. Should we go in? Emily asked, her voice a mixture of excitement and trepidation. Maybe we shouldn't, Sarah replied, a knot forming in her stomach. But the curiosity was overpowering. They stepped inside, the air stale and thick with the scent of damp wood. Inside, they found remnants of a life once lived, a dusty old couch, a broken table, and scattered papers. Among them, Sarah discovered a journal. She flipped through the pages, her heart pounding as she read the frantic scrawls of a previous occupant. They were being watched, she murmured, feeling a cold sweat break out on her forehead. This person was terrified. As she read further, a chill ran down her spine. Uh, the journal detailed strange occurrences, footsteps outside at night, a sense of being followed, and eventually the writer's descent into paranoia. It ended abruptly, with the final entry simply stating, I can't escape him. Emily gasped, her face pale. We need to leave. Now. They stumbled out of the cabin, fear propelling them back through the woods. When they reached Sarah's house, they locked the door behind them, the sense of safety feeling more like a prison. That night, they tried to distract themselves with movies, laughter echoing in the air, but the weight of their discovery lingered. Just as they began to relax, there was another loud bang against the house, followed by a scraping sound. Sarah's heart sank. They both jumped up, eyes wide with terror. What is happening? Emily cried, her voice trembling. I don't know, but we need to call the police, Sarah said, her hands shaking as she dialed. As she spoke to the operator, 
The banging intensified, rattling the windows. Suddenly the lights flickered and went out, plunging them into darkness. Panic surged as they heard a low voice whispering from outside, Let me in, Sarah. Terror gripped her, and she clutched the phone, her heart racing. Stay away from the windows, she shouted to Emily. She shouted to Emily, who was frozen in fear. Emily whispered, her voice barely audible. I don't know, Sarah replied, her voice cracking. I don't know. The whispers continued, growing louder and more insistent. You can't hide from me, Sarah. I just want to see you. Sarah felt her breath quicken as the sound of footsteps approached the door. She pressed herself against the wall, the weight of fear bearing down on her. Just then, the police arrived, their lights flashing through the windows, casting eerie shadows on the walls. Stay inside, we're coming to help, an officer shouted. Sarah and Emily rushed to the door, throwing it open to find the officers outside. They explained everything about the figure, the whispers, the journal. The, the officers exchanged worried glances and immediately fanned out around the house. Suddenly, one of the officers shouted, We found footprints leading into the woods. A wave of panic washed over Sarah. What does that mean? Is he out there? We'll search the area, the officer reassured her, but Sarah could see the concern etched on his face. They waited anxiously as the officers searched the woods. Minutes felt like hours as fear gnawed at them. Just as Sarah thought they might be safe, an officer burst through the door, his face pale. We need to go. Now. What happened? Emily cried, her eyes wide with terror. He's in the woods, the officer said, urgency in his voice. We've lost sight of him, but he's been watching your house for days. In a panic, they were ushered into a squad car, and the officer drove them to the station. As they pulled away, Sarah glanced back at her house, a feeling of loss and fear settling in her chest. They would never return. In the days that followed, Sarah and Emily stayed in a hotel, unable to shake the feeling of being watched. The police, the police conducted searches, but Leonard was never found. The town eventually began to forget the strange occurrences, but Sarah knew the truth. Cedar Hollow was not as safe as it seemed. It held secrets in its shadows, and she would always remember the whispers that haunted her dreams and the eyes that watched from the dark. As she and Emily sat in the hotel room, sipping coffee and trying to piece their lives back together, Sarah could feel the weight of the past still pressing down on her. There were some things you could never truly escape.